we have enough time to read the whole chapter, but we're going to start verse number 1. The Bible says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry unto or cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen in regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall precede themselves. Now, if we go back to verse number 1, it says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Habakkuk is not living through this necessarily. He has been given a vision from God to see things which shall come after him. And it's his job to spread the news that the people of God can either get right or they can suffer what Habakkuk has seen. And in verse number 2, Habakkuk says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? He's saying, once these days come, once what God says is going to happen does happen, you can cry, but no answer will come. Because God gave you a space of grace to get it made right, and you chose not to do it. You're going to have to reap what you sow. Right? We heard about Wednesday night, just because you stop sinning doesn't mean you don't have to pay for the sins that you committed before you got right with God. Right? That's just the way that God framed the universe. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. That means God intended it to be this way, and that's the way it's going to be until God destroys heaven and earth, and we get new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. But what is that way? You shall reap what you sow. Whatever you put in the ground is coming up, and you've got to deal with it. But he says, even cry out under the of violence. He's saying this isn't just hardship or these aren't burdens. He says violence. The people of God would be in dire straits. How dire? Life or death. And yet God says he's not going to intervene because he already offered to, but they rejected him. Verse number three. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? He's saying, Lord, what you've shown me the things that will become to your people, he says, it's so wicked that it grieves his own soul. He says, what's coming? Right? Essentially, it makes him sick right down to his soul. He says, what? can I get a good vision? Is what he's saying, rhetorically. But he knows the answer. He says, he was showing it so that he could give that burden to other people. What was that burden? Israel needs to get right. Then to get right quick. But he goes on to say, For spoiling and violence are before me. That means everything that Israel had would be taken away. Violence is the means by which it would be taken. They aren't going to show up and say, Hey, can we have this? They're coming to take it. Then they're willing to kill and be killed for it. That's how intense they are about showing up and taking back or taking what they think is theirs. And I say taking back because we'll get to it here in a second. We're going to do a little bit of a history lesson. But the Chaldeans are the ones that are coming. If you study it out, you know where the Chaldeans originally lived? In Canaan. You know what God gave Israel after he led them out of Egypt? Canaan. Because he gave it to him long before that when he promised it to Abraham. So these people are coming back with what they think is righteous indignation to take back what was taken from their people. Violence is the only way that it's going to be taken. They're not going to sit down and have a powwow around you know, a drum circle. 
Okay? They're coming with horses, they're coming with swords, they're coming with chariots, they're coming in violence. It says, and there are that raise up strife and contention. He says, there's violence on the outside, but God's people are stirring up strife and contention inside. They don't know what to do because they're following after man and not God, and everybody's got their own opin opinion. Well, it says, therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Because, he says there are still righteous. There are still righteous people. He says, but they're compassed about by the wicked. They're encircled, they're ensnared, for lack of a better term. Now because the righteous have been hindered, the law of God's been perverted, it's been forgotten, and it's been junked for whatever man says is right. But look at the end of verse number 4. Wrong judgment proceedeth. It says the law is slacked at the beginning of the verse. People don't care about what's right and wrong anymore. They just care about being correct or incorrect in the eyes of society. Right? The goalposts change based off of what you want somebody to think about you. But it says the law, you know what the law means? It's written in stone. The first bit of the law literally was carved by the very finger of God onto stone tablets for Moses to take down off the mountain. That's how permanent God said that it was. In fact, His words forever settled in heaven. You know what that means? God's laws and judgments are forever going to be in heaven. Well, verse number 5 says, Behold ye among the heathen. He's talking here, not to God's people. He's talking to the heathen. Those are the Gentiles. Those are those that don't know the true God. That's what heathen means. They worship something, but they don't know the true meaning or the true understanding of who really framed our universe, our world, who breathed into man the breath of life. That's why they're heathens. Right? They believe foolishness. Well, he says, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. In other words, he's saying, Take note of this. For I will work a work in your days. He doesn't say this to Israel. He's saying this to the heathens. Why? So that the heathen can see and know that the God of Israel is Jehovah God. He says, which ye will not believe, though it be told to you. He's saying, take a note. There's going to be some among you that don't believe it. Even though it was told beforehand, even though it came to pass just as the rest of the book of Habakkuk says that it will. He says, it was foretold so that you would believe, but you're not going to believe it because nobody cared when it was told. Nobody spread the news. Nobody listened when Habakkuk said it. So when the time came, the heathens didn't know to be looking. He says, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. I've got to turn page. which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. God says, the Chaldeans are coming. Not only that, He says, I will raise up the Chaldeans. Now what we're going to find out here in a second is that means God's going to take something that wasn't strong and make it strong for one purpose to execute God's judgment. Which shall mark through the breadth of the land. You know what that means? From one side to the other. No stone unturned. To possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. That means that they're not just going to march through the country. They're, staying, they're occupying. They're kicking those that had the houses out. And what are they doing? They're moving in. They're there to stay. It says they are terrible and dreadful. Terrible. 
speaking of their morality. The Chaldeans had no qualms about playing dirty. But also the Chaldeans did not hold things that God's people held as valuable or important. They were heathens, a bunch of idolaters. How'd they live? They lived like the world in depravity. They're terrible, but it also says, and dreadful. Terrible talks about their morality. Dreadful talks about their actions. Everything they did brought dread to God's people, to God's land. Well, how dreadful was it? It was so dreadful that Habakkuk a few verses ago said, Lord, how come I got to see this? He says, how come I can't tell them about how much you love them? Well, he does love them. That's why he's telling them what's coming so they can get right. All the things that Habakkuk saw the Chaldeans do to God's people. He said that it grieved him. Now, we've said it before, that word grieved. The best definition I can find for it is, is it's, it's as if to be torn apart by barbed hooks. Literally. Imagine, if you would, you all seen people tan leather the old-fashioned way. How do they do it? They take a piece of skin, they run a bunch of line through it, and then they stretch it. Well, imagine that was your soul, and instead of gut line or whatever else they may be using to stretch it out, imagine that it's just barbed hooks pulling you in different directions. You feel like at any moment you're going to tear at the very seams. That's what grieved me. Well, how dreadful are they that Habakkuk got grieved seeing what they were going to do? He didn't even have to live it or experience it to be grieved. He said, Lord, what's coming is awful. And it grieved him. That's why he had a burden to tell God's people about it so that they wouldn't have to endure it. But it says, Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. You know what the Chaldeans did? What the Chaldeans thought was right. But what did the Chaldeans do? What did they think was right? Same thing that the world thinks is right. My right to my claim to myself. The very essence of sin, they did that which was right in their own eyes. But it says their judgment and their dignity. If you're dignified, that means that there's something about you that's greater than yourself. Right? You act on the behalf of the well-being of others, not yourself. If you were a dignity, you were supposed to represent yourself as if you were just a messenger. Okay, if you were a dignitary from another country, what's that mean? You're there to represent something or someone else. It wasn't about you. It was about what you were on business about, for lack of a better term. Well, see... For many years, Israel's dignity was that they were God's chosen people. They didn't do what they did because it's what they wanted to do. They did everything that they did because thus commanded the Lord. And that's when Israel was great. Because God exalted His people for their obedience. But He says the Chaldeans, their dignity shall proceed to themselves. You know what that means? They're very selfish people. They don't care about you. They don't care about the person standing right next to them. They care about themselves. Everything that they do will speak to the fact that they want more. And if they got to kill you to get it, they'll do it with a, in a heartbeat, without a second thought. But it says their judgment shall proceed to themselves. It's corrupt. It's wicked. It doesn't make sense. Right? Anybody ever play a game? as a kid or as an adult where you're pretty sure the other person was just making up the rules as they went so that you lost on purpose that's what this is talking about their judgment doesn't, there is no high court of the Chaldeans where you can go and say hey what's the law say no the law was what they said it was and just because it wasn't what it was yesterday doesn't mean that that's not what you got to deal with today they were very fickle. They weren't worried about the long term. They were worried about the short term. Now, I want to be able to do what I want to do today. Well, what if you change your mind tomorrow? We'll deal with that tomorrow. 
Right now, this is what's right and this is what's wrong. It's the way of the world. Well, go back, beginning of verse number 6. It says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. Now, at this point in time, if historians are correct, which for all I know, I got no reason to argue with them, but at this time, roughly 620 years before Christ came, the Chaldeans did not exist as a nation. Well, you said, didn't God just say he was going to raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and swift nation? Yeah, bitter and hasty nation. Yeah, that's what he said. Which is why he said, even though I'm going to tell you ahead of time, you're not going to believe it. Because as everybody thought, Chaldeans had long ago been done away with. Yeah, you don't believe me? Go back to the book of Daniel, which was roughly 70, 80 years before that. When Nebuchadnezzar came in and he took the children of God, the people of Israel, captive, he took their smartest, their best, their brightest, and what did he do? He separated them so that they could become a part of his wise men. Well, what were his wise men called? The Chaldeans. The Chaldeans had long, 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 long time ago, okay, Originally, they came from a northern part of what today we would call Iraq. Okay? Well, long before Babylon, and long before Nebuchadnezzar was ever king of Babylon, between where Babylon started and where Israel was, the Chaldeans were in the middle. What happened? They got occupied and they got conquered a long time ago. Well, the Chaldeans, the people that were conquered, that had a place that was a nation called Chaldea, as I understand it. When they were conquered, they were known to be soothsayers and magicians and warlocks, witches. They claimed to be uh, astrologers that they could read the stars and tell you what the future was going to be. They were known for mysticism. Okay. So when they got taken over, apparently they were so good at it that they became the advisors to the Babylonian kings. So all those people that joined that order, right, the wise men of the Babylonian kings, what did they call them? The Chaldeans. Okay, that's why when we get to the book of Daniel, it says, hey, the Chaldeans, it's not talking about a nation, it's talking about the witches and warlocks and, you know, the people that come out and cut themselves to a god and claim they can see visions and all that. That's who it's talking about, the wise men of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, why did you say wise men? Because every time God told something to Daniel or God said that something was going to happen, it happened, and the wise men looked like idiots. That's nothing new. You can go back, you know, if you want to know more about the group, right, the position of being a child in. It's just like those that when Moses went down to Pharaoh, Pharaoh had his magicians, his wise men, that when, Fer or when Moses threw his staff down and God turned it into a snake and then he bent down and picked it up and then turned back into a stick again, Pharaoh says, ah, I got guys that can do that. And they did. But how'd they do that? Because I can't throw a stick down and make a snake. Right? And demonic is what it was. Okay? But Moses' stick ate up all the other sticks to show that his stick had more power than their stick. But Pharaoh said, ah, I'm not buying it. So then, well, water turns into blood. They show up. They say, oh, we can do the same thing. And what did they do? They did a magic trick. Fooled Pharaoh. And he says, nope, my guys can do that too. I'm not impressed. Your guys tried to do it with a cup of water. Right? Or a, a veg The whole river's blood now. Not just the whole Nile River. All the water in your house got turned into blood. But every pond, every cup in all the nation of Egypt got turned into blood like that. And you think because your guy over here added red food color into the water that that means they can do that too? If they can do it, tell them to undo what just happened. 
and they couldn't. But yet, every time it happened, Pharaoh's heart just got harder and harder until what? Until God finally broke it. Well, a little bit more of a history lesson for you. The nation of Chaldea, the language of Chaldea, the Chaldeans as a people, long ago, got conquered by the Babylonians. And then, out of almost nowhere, there's this group called the Persians that showed up. But who are the Persians? Well, the Persians are the one that kicked Babylon's rear end and took over everything that they owned. But that came from a place that nowadays, geographically, we might call it Iran. Okay. Same neck of the woods as northern Iraq. Well, the Bible makes a clear distinction between the Persians and the Babylonians because afterwards you'll find that the kings were the, the Babylonian kings and the Persian kings. They were known as the kings of the Medes. M-E-D-E-S and Persians who were the Medes that was the Babylon who were the Persians everybody else doesn't say that they were the Medes the Chaldeans and the per nope and after the Persians come in and defeat Babylon they kept a district known as Babylon they kept a district known as Assyria Right, because that was an actual land group. There was no king or governor of Chaldea because it didn't exist no more. It had been wiped off the map. So when God says he's going to raise up the Chaldeans, he says, I'm going to take something that you thought was dead and long and gone. I'm going to raise up that nation. He's not talking about the sorcerers and the soothsayers. He says, they're not going to be a big army. He says, I'm going to take a dead off the face of the earth and raise them, and they're going to come in, and they're going to kick the biggest and the baddest person that you know, which is Babylon. So what happens? Persians come in and kick their rear ends. Who paid the price? The people on the ground, God's people. Then from that day forward, there's a whole lot of infighting, a whole lot of backstabbing, a whole lot of assassination attempts. Why? Because they had no law. They had no justice. They had no dignity. It was all every man for himself. In fact, the reason that the Persian Empire stopped being an empire is because everybody basically said, I'm taking what's mine and I'm going home. We don't want to play by your rules anymore. I'm in charge of this bit and you guys can fight over the rest. But they did. Well, did a little bit of reading on Chaldeans their society very pagan big idolaters but the nation of Chaldea before it was destroyed they were quote unquote wise men they knew about math they knew, in fact when they were taken over by the Babylonians the reason they were made wise men is because they could read and write better than anybody else so they put them in charge of writing things down and studying things and keeping records and stuff that's why the advisory group later was called the Chaldeans. Well, you say, how can a nation be taken over and then no evidence be left? Well, it's not that hard. It happened to Israel, too. Babylon came in and took over Israel, and what happened? They lost all their land. Back for a long time, Israel didn't exist anymore. It was just the Hebrews. They were just people that used to be from Israel. You'd study all the way up until World War II. They had been intermingled with the populations of the rest of the world. They had no nation of their own. Well, what happened to the Chaldeans? Same thing. The only reason there's a nation today on the map that says Israel is because, one, God prophesied that it was going to happen, and it did. But two... After World War II, a bunch of people said, hey, these people were almost wiped off the face of the earth by a madman. Some conservative estimates, six, more likely somewhere upwards of 12 million Jews killed during World War II. 
and they desired to have a place that was their own. Well, what used to be Israel? And everybody says, uh -huh. Well, I can tell you, we can go to the Old Testament. It says it went from the Nile River all the way to the Euphrates. But see, there's a lot of people that own a whole lot of that back in the 40s that didn't want to give it up. I'll give you three letters as to why. O-I-L, oil. Nope, you can't have that. So what'd they give them? They gave them a slice of desert that included what used to be their capital city, Jerusalem. And when they did that, the people that currently lived there weren't too happy about it. And they're still trying to kill them today to get it back. That's called Palestine. Which, by the way, Palestine historically never existed. It really, Palestine would be the Philistines at best. But, all that being said, the Chaldeans had been known that they would become assimilated into the other people. But, morally, okay, maybe intellectually, <coughs> maybe through teaching the next generation, because these were the smart guys, who's going to teach the next generation? The smart guys. They always left their mark on the nation that took them over. They would always find some way to get close to power, even though they may not necessarily be the ruling power, and they always twisted things around. But what happens when the Persians come in? Go study it out. There was a king named Artaxerxes in the Bible. He came in. He was known to have his great armies. Okay, in fact, uh, one of the old tales of the Battle of Thermopylae, okay, that, that would be the 300 Spartans against the whole Persian army. Okay, they said that who did he send in first? The Persian magicians and sorcerers and everything else. Where do you think those guys came from? Same place the Chaldeans did. For lack of a better term, God is <clears throat> literally saying people are going to be coming from a place that you thought was already conquered. Now, you thought that this over here wasn't a problem, that you could leave it and let it be its own thing and ignore it, and then everything still work out because, you know, you say it's going to be so. No. God tells us to tend our vineyard. Right? We're supposed to make up the heads. We're supposed to rebuild walls when they have cracks in them. Why? To keep the foxes out that spoil the vine. To keep those things on the outside of what God gave you that are dangerous and keep those things on the inside that are valuable to you because God gave them to you. He said, but Babylon ignored this over here and I'm going to send in a great nation. Who was that? Those persons. But he called them by the name the Chaldeans. Because people knew who the Chaldeans were. Who were they? They were slimy. They were greasy. They were down good, or down low, no good. Soothsaying. Gainsayers. Stab you in the back to get a position of power. Learn all these magic tricks or come up with their own logic so that they can make other people look dumb. To what extent? That they could be in control. But if you study it out, we get to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> You're going to find there that there's the great whore of Babylon. God says that she slew the prophets. God says that because of her, God's people were persecuted, driven out. But who's the great whore of Babylon? Well, eventually it ends up being this thing called the Catholic Church. But, how'd that start? Well, see, the Chaldeans, they could become a part of any society and take what it is that they believed, which really they don't believe anything. They just want to be able to do what they want to do and get away with it. But in order to justify it, in order to make an impression upon rulers, what you got to do, you got to find yourself next to important people. So what do they always do? They take what they believe and they can just incorporate it with whatever's around them. Chaldeans get taken over by Babylon. The next thing you know, they're advisors to the king. What's that mean? They converted to what the king wanted them to believe. But next thing you know, they start changing it and perverting it into what 
is this amalgamation where everybody's happy with what everybody believes. Right? You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. We can all believe the same thing. Well, then the Persians come in. But how do the Persians take over this great swath of land or supposedly everybody before that believed something completely different. But yet, by the end of it, you got all these... At the end of the Persian Empire, you've got a whole bunch of Persians and Syrians that are all speaking the same language, that all relatively believe the same thing. How'd that happen? Because it all got mixed together into something where everybody could find palatable. Then who comes in after that? Well, eventually Rome. And Rome was a bunch of pagans. But yet there was a whole bunch of people that found themselves in the positions of authority. Right? Spiritual advisors, so to speak. In fact, you find the Apostle Paul when he goes to Mars Hill. They were so afraid of being wrong that they had idols and they had sculptures depicting everything. And then in case they forgot one, they had a table dedicated to the unknown God in case they weren't smart enough to figure it out. And Paul got to preach and said, I'll tell you who that is, and you can junk the rest of these because the one you don't know about is greater than anything you can dream up. But what happens after people start getting right with God in the Roman Emperor, or Roman Empire? Nero comes along and starts persecuting them. Well then, out of this thing called Rome, some 400 years after Jesus dies, you get the actual beginning. They'll say that they started with Jesus, liar. They started long before Jesus ever came. They just took on a new name called Catholic. But, what do they do? They make themselves integral to the Roman Empire until it crumbles. Then you get this thing called the Holy Roman Empire. Well, how can you be in charge of something, right, Rome, that they don't even own? So that's when they started picking a king from all these European nations and saying, hey, will you protect us if we make you emperor of everything that Rome owns? And he's like, I already own it. Why do I need your approval? But because all the people were Catholic, they said, well, if the Pope doesn't like you, then you're not our king. Who's really in control in that situation? The Pope or the King? And just being honest. Then we get all the way to the point, way on down the road, that they think that they've gotten rid of everybody that doesn't believe like them. There's things like the Spanish Inquisition. Right? There's things like uh, essentially driving out everybody that doesn't believe like they do why do you think pilgrims were so intent on being pilgrims but they didn't hop on a cruise ship and then come on over to America where they got all you could eat food and they had you know shuffleboard and everything else to keep them entertained on the boat no they got into rickety and if we're being honest tiny ships that were way overcrowded way understaffed and way undersupplied and they risked months at sea doing this the whole time in the water. All for the hope at being able to worship God free of persecution. They said, even if we don't make it, it's better to die in the pursuit than to live with them jokers. But if the title of Chaldean tells you anything, what's it mean? They're willing to do as verse number 6 tells us or verse number 7 sorry terrible and dreadful things to shut you up so that they can keep on doing what they were doing long before you ever came on the map they don't mind that you're a Christian you know what they mind when you start making people that aren't Christians into Christians because that's quote unquote their territory the Chaldeans got lots of tricks I mean, we already talked about it in Pharaoh's day. They could mimic the miracles of God only for God to show that His power was better, and bigger than their power. And He did the one thing 
that they couldn't argue with. He killed the firstborn child of all of Egypt. He didn't just kill of all of Egypt. All the livestock, all the animals that they didn't own that were out in the field. Everything that had kids, the firstborn died. But Egypt thought that their wise men told them about a God that was able to have power over death and life. But what do you think happened? They took all them dead people to the wise men and they said, hey, pray to so-and-so and have them raise them from the dead. They never got up. They never breathed another breath. Well, for a while they gave up. And then what happened? Somebody starts talking in Pharaoh's ear. You really going to let them get away with all that gold? All them animals, all that fabric? They start stirring Pharaoh. What do you think? Next thing you know, he says, nope, change my mind, y'all going to die. He's trying to run them into the Red Sea and drown them. And if they don't want to go into the sea, he'll run them over with all them chariots. Only for God to show up as a great wall of fire. Keep them separated. For, if, I don't know about you, but if I was running after somebody and they're like, hey, I'm angry at you, and then out of nowhere, a giant wall of fire shows up, Maybe it's time for me to go home. Yeah, Pharaoh, I know I said that I thought we could take them because, I mean, they've been slaves for 400 years. They don't know how to fight. They don't know how to ride horses or, you know, chariots and use any of the stuff that they just took with them. But I'm pretty sure we don't know how to do that. We can't make wall of fire show up out of nowhere. I think we ought to go home. But they didn't go home. What happened? They all got drowned in the Red Sea. See, the Chaldeans represented that he's going to raise up a people. At this point, they weren't a people. They were just a group. Remember, they were advisors. They were the wise men. He says, I'm going to raise up a whole nation just like that group. Everybody knew who the Chaldeans were. They are the ones that plotted to have Daniel killed because he prayed three times a day and because he was the king's favorite. Even though Daniel, just being Daniel, wanted to live and serve and be faithful to God and God exalted him because of it. He found favor in the eyes of kings of Babylon. And as a result, they treated God's people more favorably because it was one of Daniel's people. It was one of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's people. They were made princes over provinces. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? The Chaldeans were the ones that were scheming behind the scenes. They couldn't say what they wanted to do because they knew the king would never sign it if it said, hey, we want you to put Daniel to death. Oh, not going to do it. What's he ever done to me? All he's ever done is bring riches and honor and fame to my house. He's been faithful. Why would I kill him? And then the answer is because we don't like him. He'd have told him to suck eggs and go home. So they couldn't do that. What they do? They had to scheme. There's always something going on in the shadows. Something written on paper that they know the king is not going to catch it. But they put a loophole in there to snare one of God's. As a result, what happens? Daniel get thrown in a line then. Well, what happens when the king opens it up? He says, Daniel, is your God able? And he says, oh, king, live forever. I got good news. The angel was dispatched, came down here and shut all them lions' mouths. I slept like a baby all night. But he's saying, brother, the Chaldeans were always there. They were scheming in the back. He says, everybody knew what the Chaldeans were capable of. They were treacherous. I mean, I imagine that if you had a conversation with them, you'd come away calling them what Jesus called the Pharisees, a generation of vipers. There's a bunch of snakes just trying to kill each other. Why? So that they could live in their wicked, depraved, or depraved right, vanities. And they could be as wicked as they wanted to be without you being able to tell them to stop. That's all they wanted. God says, I'm going to raise up a whole nation of them people. And they're going to come in, and they're not just going to vex They're going to be in charge. You're not going to have to fight them. They're going to be your overlords. 
And you go study out. We don't have time to get into it all today. But study out the depraved things that have happened in the name of Christianity. Those that claim that they love God and want what's best for you in your life. No, all they want to do is be as wicked as they can be behind the curtain. But yet, still come out and hobnob with all the people that are in power. And control the way that you live your life so that you can't tell them how to live their life. Habakkuk says living with those people they're terrible and dreadful you know what America's slowly turning into terrible and dreadful you know why it's because there's a group of Chaldeans somewhere they may be behind the, the veil they may be behind the scenes you're going to hear people call them things like Illuminati okay, or the you know the, the dark government the black government Okay, or the Jesuits or you can put whatever name you want to on it you know what the truth is it's just another generation of Chaldeans they've been around since the beginning but you know what so many times in your Bible God shows up and shuts the Chaldeans up you know when he does that when God's people repent from perverting his laws and his judgments and they go back to calling a spade a spade and they call sin, sin. And they call iniquity, iniquity. And they enforce God's will upon themselves and other people. If revival, I'm not talking about revival here. If a global revival don't happen, the Chaldeans going to get more and more power. And it's going to get worse and worse. But even in those times, God still takes care of the righteous. The righteous can still go out and make converts. What I'm saying is nothing happens without God signing off on it. Who raised up the Chaldeans? God did. Why? For His own honor and glory. To His purpose. So if there's a horde of them on the horizon, that doesn't mean anything. All that means is, is God's gearing up something. It's got to get worse before the end times can happen. But I know that they can't do nothing to me unless God signs off on it first. The Chaldeans doesn't scare a child of God. You know what scares the child of God? Hearing that God says the Chaldeans are going to come in and be allowed to take over. I know if I'm righteous, Chaldeans can't touch me. If I'm living as us saith the Lord, you can say that I'm in captivity but I'm still freer than the day I was born because Jesus, if the Son sets you free, you be free indeed. The Chaldeans, they sound scary and they got powerful friends and they got scary things that they can do, but you know what the end story is? God still wins. Those that are on God's side, they still win. It's been happening since the beginning, but the outcome is always the same. God raises it for His purpose. They can't take one more step than what God will let them, and they can't back up any less than what God says they can. He's in the palm of, or I mean, they're in the palm of his, just as much as a saved person. He can destroy them. He can raise them up. No man comes to power unless God ordains it. No less. A group of people. So if it gets darker... What's that mean? God's doing something. And if they seem to go off the scene, what's that mean? God's doing something. But Habakkuk's message to Israel was, God says they're coming. Whether Israel gets right or not, you've got to make the choice on whether you want to get right or not. You've got to make the choice whether you're on God's side. If you want to make up the hedge and rebuild the walls in your vineyard so that when they come in, God spares some of the destruction your way. He's saying you can either get to work for what's right or you can be conquered by what's wrong. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.